Yeah, I've been a labor and community organizer for, wow, 20 years now. Um, and I feel like, you know, this is, this is a moment that, and hopefully this, this is going to be sustained, but this is a moment that is unique in my organizing career at the level that it's been sustained. I think people who have been around longer have seen other movement moments. And so one of the conversations is how do we adapt to that moment um, and do the organizing and the movement building that's required of the times in which we live. And I don't think any of us exactly know what, what that means or what we should be doing, but I just wanted to throw out a couple thoughts and ideas for discussion. So the first is I'm presuming that we are all um, lefties to some degree. This is left-wing school. And so we think that, you know, capitalism doesn't work or that the market economy doesn't work. I don't know anyone blocking consensus on that. Um, so, so thinking about my organizing career, which was the bulk of my time was with ACORN, which I believed you know, was the left flank of the work that we could do that got to scale and was big and made sense. And sort of thinking about that analysis, almost everything that we fought for was a market-based solution and was in fact, and frankly labor organizing is the same way, um, <clears throat> And that you can see in a couple short years that all the gains that we think we made can be eviscerated pretty quickly. So for example, ACORN's work over 25 years significantly increasing the percentage of homeowners in this country. In three years with the, you know, the, bank, the banks crashing the economy through their use of the um, you know, million things that we can get into, the derivatives, the casino economy, completely destroying all the gains we made in home ownership, particularly among low income folks and folks of color. Um, if you look at, you know, the operating assumption for those of us in the, in the center left that said, okay, if we elect a different pre you know, if we elect President Obama, there's going to be change, we're going to win the things that we fought for. Even what is probably the most transformative piece of his um, first term, which is healthcare legislation, we have a market-based solution to healthcare, um, which will probably, depending on who's in power, not really be that much different than what we have now, unfortunately. Um, you know, I was just in Chile briefly over the summer, and they have guaranteed health care for all, and there's a public plan and a private plan, and if you're in the public system, you got nothing. You got the same, you know, mediocre, you have horrible insurance, it doesn't work for you, and if you're in the private system, you get everything that folks who have money here get, or folks who have money there get. So it's sort of, I feel like this is, we're not changing the equation. Um, and I think that what we lack as organizers is we lack two things. We lack an understanding about how to build different kinds of organizations. And the second thing is I think we lack a specific program. I think we're often good on the ideology and where we want to go, but the intermediate steps to get there are very hard for us. And I think we have this certainly speaking for me, my generation, because we were raised in a, in a climate of, you know, let's talk to people where they're at, let's be realistic, let's be specific, let's win what we can, we don't have a way to think about ideas that are non-market based. So for example, most of my work is around, is still around housing, organizing, helping families stop foreclosure. Um, so the biggest idea that we have that we think will, will be game changing, and to some degree it will be, is principal write down of everyone's mortgage. So we've got millions of people who are what is called underwater on their mortgages. They owe much more than their house is worth, and they're stuck. And if the banks would write down the principal, um, then a lot more people could stay in their homes because they'd have lower monthly payments, and they would also, you know, you'd have more money to spend, so there'd be more jobs created. There's a lot of good things that would happen with principal write down. But at the same time, you're sort of assessing an arbitrary worth on, you know, bricks and mortar or whatever houses are made out of in a piece of land, and so still based on the geography of that building. Um, so while it's a significant win, it's still putting us, you know, at the, the whim of the market economy, and we're not able to have a much more fundamental question about land and housing and people's right to safe and affordable housing. So what gets us there? I don't you know, what are the intermediate demands? I don't know. Um, 
But I think throwing a couple thoughts out for discussion is one, we as the government essentially own huge amounts of housing right now. So we own Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Right? We're giving them billions of dollars a year to stay afloat. They have huge amounts of property on their books in addition to the banks that we've bailed out. And we need to figure out both local solutions and national solutions to get that housing stock and turn it over, not to individuals necessarily, but maybe to community groups. And we need to redefine our definition of what community groups are and sweat equity. You know, Digger, Michael, and I ought to be able to create a community group, not have to file for formal 501c3 status, and be able to turn the house into what we want with sweat equity. So there, we need to think creatively about those solutions, sort of leverage local political power to win those things so that we can think about having a different, more fundamental question about how we deal with housing. Um, on worker organizing, I also want to say that I think there's the same opportunity. So traditionally, the way labor unions operate, um, your goal is to get folks to organize at a given workplace and then sign a contract, get recognized by the boss, sign a contract with the boss, the boss gives you, you know, and then your job is to fight for better wages. But you're still acknowledging that, you know, both you're acknowledging the boss's power, but you're also not changing the industry because once you have, I mean, the militancy of unions often gets tamped down once you, you know, even the greatest union campaigns, justice for janitors, you're winning a huge amount, you're winning health care, you're winning dignity, you're winning living wages, or, you know, not always living wages for janitors, but certainly you're getting there. Um, but at the same time, you're sort of codifying the system, and there's two problems. One, we can't get to scale in union organizing right now. Union density is just dropping like a stone. The percentage of workers continues to drop, even, you know, even though there's thousands more workers in motion in Ohio and Wisconsin and other places. Labor organizing is being eviscerated. And the second is, if we're fighting shop by shop, floor by, you know, workplace by workplace, the, the rules are all stacked against us. And that some of our best minds need to be thinking creatively about worker organizations that we can call unions or not call unions, but are more transformative across worker organizations. So, you know, can you have a green workers association where you're thinking about how to change the industry? So there's, you know, thousands of people getting trained to do weatherization all over the country. A lot of times, and there's no jobs for them necessarily, like this great weatherization boom hasn't been promised, or they're getting paid working in unsafe conditions and getting paid subpar wages. Can they be organized not to fight with individual contractors, but to fight overall so that governments are leveraging money so that that industry is growing? The same thing with, you know, can you organize small-scale organic farmers so that school districts are buying their programs, so that you're, you're making what is a small industry into a big industry and then bringing workers along. That's you know, certainly a market-based solution still, but at the same time, it's, it's building worker organizations, but it's not feeling like you need to get into the weeds of negotiating contracts with individual bosses. I think we can, as you're trying to change the industry by giving people some ideas of the best practices, what you can do, and this is applicable in retail, you know, if you look around, and what are the best, you know, if you organized in a more, a larger, more amalgamated fashion, you could talk about, you know, where are retail workers getting the best deals, you provide information, and then you try to leverage those agreements without signing a contract and being beholden to the boss. Um, so I sort of feel like we have this dilemma right now where some people are, you know, people still say we need to move within existing institutions. We need to move within existing labor organizations or community organizations. And I work for a you know, traditional community organization. Um, but at the same time, I think we, we need to think very creatively about new worker formations, new forms of community organizing. Um, because we have that opportunity to be creative and new ability to really lay out our fundamental premise and then start to think of those kinds of intermediate steps. So I would encourage people, and I feel like this conversation that we have in places like the left wing school a lot is like, what do you do with labor unions? And if the labor unions just all got together, we could you know, make something much bigger happen. And I think we need to continue to, to talk to existing institutions, but there's so much more space. There's new institutions springing up. Actually, I think both we need to support movement building and we need to use this time 
as a real time to build new forms of organization, particularly worker organizations, and that we need to then have a program that thinks very specifically about the levers of power that we have, local governments, state governments, um, to leverage some things that are fundamental beliefs. For me, that's the right to safe and affordable housing, and to have that fight, and to sort of take property away from the banks, whether we're taking it because we're reclaiming it and we're seizing it, or whether we're changing the rules at the local government level to take that, that property. Um, and move it out of the market economy and into the hands of a, in a much more, you know, much broader way. So, all right. So those are, I don't know, those are my initial thoughts. I thought we'd talk about these things, either new worker organizations or sort of the program. Well, I'll say one more thing. I mean, what I, what I did think was pretty interesting, you know, I do think that what's happening in, in you know, we can argue about the, totalitarianism or not, but what's happening sort of on the ground in Bolivia and Venezuela and Ecuador and a lot of other places is very interesting in that there are these intermediate solutions. Venezuela is the one I know most about. It's about taking the, the wealth and resources that the government traditionally has, the big oil company, and then moving those resources to the population by creating institutions that are non-market based, by creating local supermarkets that sell things at cost by figuring out how to legalize squatting, by figuring out, you know, there's a bunch of different things that are sort of intermediate steps to where a lot of us want to go. And that's, that, that is the program that I think all of us lack the creativity for right now, or many of us do. I think we often are much better at where we want to go than how we start to have the conversation about how to get there and differentiating among, you know, what are big wins but keep us in the same system versus start to move stuff out of the system. And I think that the Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela are very interesting models for how, how to get out of there. Um, so I don't know, thoughts? I have no, you know, no magic solution here, but that's what I want to talk about. <clears throat> All right, well, um, I think that the problem is, is that, um, when you talk about these transformative changes here and how you do it, uh, people, you know, you need power to do that. And then, so traditionally, you look to the local, state, national governments, and it's like, there's where you hit the wall, from my perspective. Um, unions support Democrats and get stabbed in the back every time. Um, you know, you talk about, yeah, yeah I love it, have banks transferring property to people, reducing mortgage. But you know you have a power structure in place that it's hard to conceive that happening with the present power structure being there. Um, I think, in my mind, the the, the key is to build uh, power structures outside um, these traditional power structures. Like I'm talking about political and economic power structures, like outside the banks, um, outside the. Cause I, I think you know the whole political structure in this country is so intensely owned by, uh, you know, the 1%, as we say, that, you know, you, you can't break that power. It's something like this could happen in Venezuela, where it's a, uh, Bolivia, a much smaller population. Bolivia, of course, 90%, I think, is indigenous people, and they could elect the national leader. I don't think that could happen here. I think it has to be a totally different model uh, and struggle. You. I think that we are not paying attention to what power local governments have. I think the national equation is much harder. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think we often look at, like, let's say that, sorry, I'm on the east side, but I'll talk about the city of St. Louis, where I live. But, so, yeah, you can say, oh, it is an impossible organizing task to figure out how do you win 15 of 28 alder seats, and, you know, it's just this crazy thing. But first of all, there are a whole bunch of smaller municipalities that it is worth it to try to figure out how to leverage power within them, who have some resources. Second, even within the city of St. Louis, 21,000 signatures puts whatever you want on the ballot. That's a volunteer effort. If we want to put an initiative on the ballot in the city of St. Louis that says, you know, we need to 
let's say there is, a, there is a public division that deals with property, right, the LRA. So the LRA or the, the code needs to change so that any, any bank-owned property that is not up to code or that is not maintained, you know, any kind of code violation within six months reverts to the LRA, which then any community group can claim. I think that's not that ratified. People would be on board for that. People's communities are getting devastated by foreclosures. Um, let's have that fight, and let's make that a fight about the banks versus us. Let's put that on the ballot. We don't need any politicians to tell us that. Um, so I, I agree with you. Nationally, there's no hope right now. Um, but locally, I think, there, I think there really is. And I also think that simultaneously, if we're running ideas, if we're running a package of three ideas, and maybe one of them is ruled unconstitutional and one of them fails, but you sort of run packages of ideas, it also builds, gives you the framework to start from the ground up building a viable, um, you know, build, building a viable third party structure, building a viable independent political organization. And will labor keep supporting the Dems? Absolutely, but labor will also support good ideas that come through the ballot, you know, come through the initiative process. So it's not an either or. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, I think we don't look at what, what resources local governments have and what leverage they have. Dustin. Um, yeah, I kind of, I'll try to get through this fast, but uh, I think a lot of what you said kind of ties into each other because you, you kind of said that like the left, like while we are all very strong in our ideology and like very firm in it, like, but we don't really, we don't really have a way forward right now. And uh, I think that kind of ties in with what you said, that there's really no magical solution. And I think a lot of the people on the left need to just realize that, that there is no magical solution. And really, no specific ideology is 100% correct. Like, we, we all have to realistically start working together and not, like, just talk about it, but actually do it. Because, like, I know a lot of people become disillusioned on the left because there's so much infighting and it gets so old and, you know, it's just one of those things that we want to argue about 1917 instead of argue about how we're going to move forward today. And I think that's a big thing to get on board with. And with local elections, uh, I think that's also very important, but it also has its boundaries. Because uh, the I was in a third party that runs local candidates wherever they can, and it took up so much money and it took up so much time with so little results. So, like, he's, I mean, yeah, it would have to be a viable one, but realistically, to have a viable one, we'd all have to shut up about 1917 and just move forward with today and us. Well, I also think, I mean, we're, we're, what are we, three months into this different movement moment with Occupy? I mean, I think we're, this is all pretty new, and we're, we're not, you know, I don't, I don't think enough of us have, have thought about, you know, what it, and maybe people who have been around longer than I can speak to whether they think this is, you know, this is a continued movement moment or not. But to the degree that we think it's going to continue, I think, and let's hope it does, and let's hope we need to do everything in our power to make sure that it does, um, that we can, that things will change in, in the sense of, of the number of people who can potentially be in motion. And I think that the more that it's the same groups, you know, talking to each other or fighting or whatever, that there's a problem. But I, I also think that we've opened up all this space. There are so many people who want to have the conversation. I do think this is a new moment in organizing, and we're not engaging them. That we're still talking to a lot of the same people that we that we still talk to. Like I still recognize most of the people in this room, and I think that you know that's why. I think building new organizations or new formations is necessary because it's not thinking, okay, this is the coalitional structure. All these, you know, six groups need to be aligned or need to get along. It's no, we need to, people need to take their own initiative. We need to build hundreds more groups than we have right now. And people need to take the initiative and do that and they need to think about how to strengthen their groups. And I think we've had this because the, the, we feel like the turf's been small and the number of organizing, organizational, organ, organizable people or groups has been small that we think that way and we think about our group versus another group. Whereas really now I think it's a time where, you know, people, huge numbers of people that I thought would never turn out or never join anything are joining groups. So we need to build those groups. And, and, and groups, 
you know, thinking more broadly, right? Is Occupy a group or is it a movement? I don't know, but it's movements, it's groups, it's things, it's autonomous actions, it's mischief making, it's worker formations, it's like all of those kinds of things. Like, we just need to be a million more ideas and things that are tried, most, a good portion of which will fail, but that's great. Like, we need to just throw a bunch of shit, out, a bunch of stuff out there because we don't know what's going to work. And, and I, I, you know, we should encourage and we should support each other in those crazier ideas that we have because we don't know what's going to work. None of us could have called it Occupy would be the thing that was going to work, right? So we don't know what's going to inspire people, but let's try a bunch of things. At the very least, we'll have a lot more interesting groups out there. Marlene? So uh, this is a really one-on-one question because I'm not that familiar with uh, present housing situations. But So clearly there's been some conceptualizing about transformative groups being able to do this. And so I'm, I'm missing a big component of that except for what I've heard you say. But then getting down, so, so are you like really saying that a new group progressive groups need to be formed that then, because I know individuals can go to the Land Reutilization Association and get housing, but can organizations do that now? Does there have to be legislation change to allow it, the organizations to do it? So like there's got to be a three-pronged thing, somebody working on legislation, somebody taking on the property, and then people who then have to be able to turn the property into livable and affordable. So I'm trying to see I'm trying to understand how big and far-reaching the thinking is on it right now. <clears throat> so, at least in this region, if we're thinking about housing, no, that's probably a good point. I'm not sure everyone, I'm not sure we even know all the, you know, we even know all the answers. But we've got a couple of different issues. So we've got in in oversupply of housing stock right now, right? St. Louis, particularly St. Louis City, although it's being decimated pretty rapidly with copper theft and brick theft and all of this. But you know, you've got a city that had 850,000 people now has 308,000 people. North County is empty, and the foreclosures is a, you know the foreclosure crisis in North St. Louis County is emptying this out. I'm not sure what the East Side looks like exactly. I imagine there's some similarities around here and around foreclosures. Um, but you have reasonable, a lot of, you know, decent houses. Um, right now, the houses that get into the public structure are ones that have been vacant five years, three to five years, best case scenario. So those houses have already been, had everything stolen from them. They're not viable. You have to have a lot of resources to rehab those houses and know how to do things that most of us don't know how to do. So the question is, how do we get those houses? Well, there's two things we need to do. And just to plug, on Tuesday, there's a National Day of Action that Occupy Wall Street called for. There's going to be a bunch of places that are doing both eviction defense and home reclamations, a combination. So one is it's families saying, I'm not leaving, and people moving in and staying with them to defend them against the sheriff. And then other groups are going to move families that have faced foreclosure, or are homeless into bank-owned properties. So part of this is an organizing question of making this a crisis and sort of forcing banks and government to make a decision. So when, if a house gets reclaimed in New York City on Tuesday, you know, what is the mayor going to do and how is he going to react um, to that? And how are we sort of, you know, forcing to see if, if this is something that, we, you know, can we win in some places essentially that anyone can move into any vacant house because the city's going to say, no, we're, this is not, we're not touching this. Um, or the banks, you know, the banks really want to throw out homeowners who are actually, who the neighbors are all saying, hey, this is great that you're in this home. You know, we need someone in that house. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to the neighborhood. Glad you're keeping up the property. You know, we're very excited for you. So I think, so one is this organizing of creating the crisis and then forcing, forcing folks to respond and essentially whether it's a legislative legalization of home reclamations or whether it's just that de facto we're doing it, I don't know which. Assuming that we wanted to talk about legislation, we need then to get the vacant property, so leaving aside families engaged in eviction defense, which we need to do a lot more of. Assuming that the vacant property needs to get into the system very quickly. 
um, so that we can do something, we can get to it before the bricks are gone, before the copper's been stolen. Um, how do we do that? So that, I think, is a legislative solution. Um, and, you know, I think that's a combination of big fines on banks that aren't keeping up vacant property. Um, I think that that's doing something when the deed is transferred at foreclosure to sort of force them to sign some code about what they're going to do that maybe includes additional fines if they're not looking for a way to make that, you know, community supported housing. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. Um, but I think that that's a piece of the legislative solution. And then I think we need resources. I mean, what I would propose, sort of the grand bargain here, is to have a combination of three things. First, um, we need to put people to work, and we need to figure out if there's a way to use expertise both on small houses and on large buildings, like maybe mass retrofitting and weatherization so that you're putting trades to work, trades people to work. I think there's problems with the historical institutional racism of the building trades. So we need to then, as part of that fight, make sure that we're moving low-income folks, folks of color, very aggressively into, if we're creating that work, into the skilled trades. Um, I think the second thing is we need community groups, community development corporations that have that capacity to be able to get those resources from the fines and others to do more rehab that they know how to do. And then the third thing is between the trades and the organizations that know how to do this, there should be a sort of how-to center where then again our nonprofit of the three of us, our block club, can go and figure out. So maybe we know Michael knows how to paint, Digger knows how to, I don't know, you know, Dig. tuck point. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how to do anything, but I can go to the how-to center and figure out how to get the license and get an electrician so we can get our house working. Um, I can deal with the bureaucracy, and so there's a how-to center that is resourced so that our mini group can then make this a block-owned house or a community-owned house. So I think, Marlene, that's sort of how I would think about the bigger organizing picture on that. Um, but I, you know, it's still in the works, but that might be some food for thought on that. Can you tell us a little bit before we run out of time what more actually does, and I heard a little bit from Kathy, because she's into the Justice Institute with some of us that are giving yeah. a workshop next time, um, the role of political education, which I think is really vital in some of the pieces that you're talking about that are missing, because uh, not only do I not know what some other work folks are doing in this room, but even though we might not want to talk about 1917, there's some barriers that continue for women and people of color and queers and folks who do want to be organizing with the sort of folks who've always done it and taken leadership. And so there's a place, I think, for us to, to talk about the barriers that keep us from working with each other. So I was just wondering how political education is a part of more so that people can figure out how to do some of the stuff you're talking about in a more, you know, radical and democratic way. Well, I think more was, I mean, just couple quick minutes on more. I mean, more is, you know, organization predominantly of um, low-income folks of color who are organizing um, around doing issue-based organizing, particularly around foreclosures um, and the housing situation. But we also have an education committee, and we have a community garden in North St. Louis, which is at um, uh, it's Visitation Church, so that's Taylor and Evans in the 18th Ward. I think it's still the 18th Ward, I they just redistricted. Yeah. Who knows? I haven't looked at the maps. Um, and it's, you know, we do some amount of leadership about bringing, I mean, our goal is to organize with folks who are unorganized, so to bring people in who haven't been involved, um, and have put them in motion. Our goal is also that we do, we believe very strongly in direct action and civil disobedience and sort of upping the ante and creating space so that more you know, traditional groups can seek, you know, for every, every time people get arrested at Bank of America, we think that the counseling agencies will be able to do a better job of helping people stay in their homes because the banks will then respond, not just to that family, but will make it a little bit easier.
for other families to stay in their homes. So it's an inside-outside strategy. Um, we do some political education. I think what we would say is we want the Justice Institute mm -hmm. to be doing the political yes. education with our members. Yes, exactly. um, That there should be, there need to be much more better programmatic, um, better programmatic stuff around political education. Okay. And I think the history is critical to that. Um, I mean, I think, and I'm looking at Greg, but you know, I think if we're talking about labor, right, the, you know, thinking about the Wobblies historically and, and traditionally and their unwillingness to sign contracts and their unwillingness of their larger vision about workers' organizations and worker formations is something we need to understand and think about if we're thinking about building different kinds of worker organizations. And so 1917 is really important to think about. Hmm. Well, um, I'd like you know to speak a little bit about the uh, legislative solutions and uh, I, you know, to some degree, there's some truth in what you say about you know the local level is, but then again, you have to look. I mean, we all probably know about civic progress and the way this very powerful organization pretty much dictates policy in the St. Louis area. You know, backed by really powerful, well-funded uh, corporations and local governments, and I think um, part of the problem in the past I see is like. You think, well, you know, what about, um, you know, totally changing the way uh, vacant properties are handled in the city? And, you, you, and the average person in the city and in the region might go, yeah, that's a great idea, great idea. So you say, well, either try to get it through legislatively or with a citizen's ballot. But what often happens, what usually happens, what almost always happens, is that the powerful, you know, put well-funded campaigns against it. It, it goes a lot of money and his effort on the left is put into a you know a campaign. People come away dispirited. I think the it's a putting a little bit of the cart before the horse because I think the way that that would work is like if you had you know say there's like um, ten thousand vacant properties in the city. Well, if you had like five hundred or a thousand of them occupied already, and people doing that. And you know, using that as a power base to demand change, that would more likely make it happen because you could say it's already happening, you know. But I, I just don't have a lot of faith these days, having been worked with the Green Party and having tried legislative and um, on the local level and electoral solutions. I just have little, you know, I've lost a lot of faith in it. But Marley. I may be getting it over my head, but I mean, I do think that it's great to be able to make these legislative changes, but if folks are just organizing among themselves and just can agree to stand on the courthouse steps, I mean, you know, it, I, I'm sure there are lots of folks in the room who, you know, bought some of these properties. I mean, it's, it's actually a competitive thing because there are developers who are actually standing on that courthouse step too to get these properties cheaply and to make money off of them. But we could be doing it too, just you know, grassroots kind of stuff and put our $1,700 together to get our first building. Or our, So I mean, there's still that, that grassroot thing that can be happening at the same time legislative things are going on, uh, uh, unifying between us. So I think two responses. First, in the, in the 1930s, when farmers were getting foreclosed on, people were disrupting sales, um, going after the auction, the bidders, and buying the properties back for a dollar and giving it back to the families who were getting foreclosed on. So I'm not sure we should be thinking about buying the properties for the market value. We should be thinking about how we use our power to give them back to the families that are being wrongfully foreclosed on. The second thing is, Digger, where I disagree with, like, I think it's an and, and also. So I actually think if you do smart campaigns because of the work that you have on the ground, um, so there's people occupying five, ten houses, you're, it's, you're, you're gaining resources because there's an initiative that has effort and momentum. And so there's some people who want to do the political side, there's some people who want to be getting us to scale around the occupations. And if there's a, a framework and an understanding of why we're taking over properties, then I think it's a different conversation. And so I actually don't think it's an, a resource drain. Uh, I think we need to be doing both. We need to be building the will for the campaign. You know, to me, one of the most interesting things of my years of organizing is this, the living wage movement. 
So in 1996, there was a spectacular loss in Missouri to raise the minimum wage in the state um, to forget 6.25 an hour at that time. And that happened in a lot of places. There were a lot of local ballot initiatives run. I was living in Houston at the time. We lost like 77 to 23. You know, the, the, the industry, everyone spent a million and a half dollars and said if ACORN and the AFL-CIO get their way they'll, and win, you know, increase the minimum wage, they'll be demanding health care for every worker next. We must stop this now, right? They totally understood what was going on. And, you know, over the course is that five minutes or five? Five minutes. Okay, cool. So over the course of a decade, 130 municipalities passed living wage ordinances, leveraged government purchasing power, and tied it in with wages. And in 2006, five states raised the minimum wage. We're going back to the ballot in Missouri this year, it looks like, to raise the minimum wage again. Yeah. The notion living wage was in our was parlance. Yeah. So I think people were not dispirited from the loss. Yeah. People were like, yeah, money beat us, so, but you know what, I talked to a whole bunch of people who were down and were bigger and more powerful than we were, even with the loss, and that there is a way to change the landscape over time. That's like local control of the police right now, in that fight with that Singfeld guy, whatever his name is, I'm trying to take that back, since we're gonna win that eventually. But. So, I think, I think we need to do both, but I think you're right. It's hard and frustrating. You should go occupy. I mean, yeah. you should all do the things that, we're co that we want to do. We'll bring you food. <laughs> Don. Or take I think a shift. It's really important to give an electoral expression to the struggles that people are doing on a daily basis. Yeah. I mean, the, the foreclosure of the occupied, uh, the idea of occupied homes that are empty instead of building new homes that nobody can afford. Yeah. That is really important, but in every municipality in our, of the state national level, you should have people running for office on a platform of legalizing that empty territory, you know, legalizing those empty homes. You, you need to give an electoral expression to that. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're, you know, you, you've lost the focus of the discussion. The problem in the United States, well, there's, there's multiple problems with doing that. Um, in the United States, that means joining the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party has been the death of every progressive movement for at least 150 years in this country. The option is to build a new party. And I've worked in the Green Party, and I'm, the, the problem with building a Green Party is that the, there's so much effort uh, like one person said, there's so much effort put into it because so many people stand away from a new party, any, any Labor Party, Green Party, whatever new party it is, people tend to stand away and let, say let those people do it. So you have this tiny minority of people who are doing an enormous amount of work. If the, the labor organizations were to be involved in creating a new party, it would be, actually be very little work to go out and get the signatures and do it. You'd have the base there. Jeff, I, I, I can understand where you're coming from with saying that people who are interested in electoral politics should do that, and people who are not interested in electoral politics should not do that. In a certain sense, that's true, but it's important to realize the danger of that. In any organization, or as organizations get to be uh, larger, there's a, a general rule that the scum rises to the top. And in the Green Party, what I've noticed is that the opportunists very quickly rise to the top of the Green Party. And so what happens is the people who know how to sell out, who know how to manipulate, who know how to maneuver, they get to be to the top of an organization. And then you need to, it, it, it's, if you have those people doing the party and the other people doing activist work, then you have activists working and then the professional politicians selling them out. And that's to be true, as true in the Green Party as it is in the Democratic Party. Yeah, I think we're finished, but are we? That's set. The people are voting with their feet. Thanks.